garlic and onions are your face. I witnessed a strange and huge disconnect between this war zone and the country that brought it to this point, the United States. This is when my goal of trying to get people to pay attention was cemented. Life in Iraq was a gruesome ritual of suicide bombings, hospitals, patrols, and roadside bombs. I would photograph the scene of the bombing, the hospitals if there were any survivors, the morgue, and then the funeral, sometimes all in one day. I stayed and stayed and stayed, not for the adrenaline rush that many hear about, but to try to end a never-ending feeling of failure, failure to get people in the United States to pay attention. Here I was on a rooftop with a family in Gaza, and here in Syria, the intimacy and love that exists no matter which side of the war one finds themselves on, if no one wins a war. So here, I find, um, this is supposed to be a white side, by the way. Uh, I found that honest, uh, often harsh, war images are necessary. Photography freezes a real moment in time forever. And being upset by an image, and rage for saying that he's good. But I also realized people won't care about someone in a different culture, language, religion, or situation unless they can relate to them first. So the Washington Post allowed me to create a weekly space called Unseen Iraq, a window into the everyday life of Iraqis living in a war zone. Reporting Unseen Iraq was my favorite part of the week. I thought about the readers, people in Washington, D.C., walking to their office after battling traffic, or even the President of the United States, and I wrote about men or people like Fatima Ali. And here, a family reunion. She wasn't able to see her parents or niece for over a year due to the study violence surrounding the money which subsided for just a few months at this time. And here, a fisherman tries to cool off in the morning, fighting the rocks and patient sun. Because of the military convoys and main streets without the traffic, driving through Baghdad was often impossible. The fishermen on the Tigris River became river taxis. And here, a dust storm. Best friends were told to come home before the street lights come on, something my mom used to tell me growing up in small towns. And beauty contests, things people normally don't see from around. Little Miriam in this photo was homeless. Her family owned a house next to one of Saddam's palaces when it was bombed. The columns embrace the weirdness of people too. Individual personalities here a Kurdish man exercises. So I feel honored to be a female photographer covering Iraq and Afghanistan. I was somehow allowed to be in a man's face, probably because of the war, and I was allowed to photograph women. And to stay sane during extended periods of time in these areas, I drove, I dove into long-term stories. For one of these stories, I decided to report on a profession that tends to thrive in wartime, prostitution. I interviewed almost 40 sex workers before I met Anna, a woman who wanted to tell her stories, didn't ask for money, and was well aware of the possible consequences of the story. She was brave. Anna's husband died in the violence that followed to the fall of Baghdad, but more than the situation that she found herself in, I wanted to share a different voice, one that didn't normally, we didn't normally hear about, to describe this war. To support her children and extended family members, she was forced into sex work. Here, Helen negotiates with a man from Fallujah. Helen became my best friend for the year that I followed her. I spent all of my spare time in her apartment with her little boys as they played, often under the eye of the next customer. Scary, both like figures. It was just something I couldn't understand. For a short while, some Iraqi communities were finding jobs for women who lost husbands in the violence. Their job was to body search other women, which at that time many women were being used as suicide bombers. So I did a portrait series like this to focus on the individual personalities and feelings of these women. And when you see them one after one, um, the head scars and the abayas, they melt away. And you see the rage, the sadness, the empty resignation, the doubt, the determination, and the anger. You see them as individuals. So I rarely know when I succeed in getting people to pay attention. One year, I spent a lot of time in the camps of displaced people living in Kabul, Afghanistan. In the camps of tens of thousands of displaced people from war torn Afghanistan, many displaced people were from the south and not used to the beautiful snow. This photo is in the front of here, um, and children like this little boy were freezing to death in the camps. The Afghan government said that the people in the camps were lying, that this was not happening. So when it happened again, the camp leaders called me. I was allowed to go into a room of these women where they were washing and mourning this loss of baby Khan, the slice, once of life. This photo ran on the front page of the New York Times, and the reaction to it was intense. The Afghan government, the U.S. military, aid organizations, individual people, all took action to help the displaced. What is it about some photos that gets people to pay attention and others not? I think here it was again about getting people to relate to each other. This photo ran just days after Christmas. 
It echoes much of the imagery from the nativity scene, drawing deep connections between cultures and religions. But this kind of direct reaction to a photo has only happened a handful of times in my 20 years as a photographer. So this is a post video. The chaos I covered overseas made me curious about what people in my country think democracy means. A country that often exports the idea of democracy in a place where some people are willing to die for it. And so I began to document our societies in the United States' connection to this widely used, often misunderstood concept to find a better answer than the definition I gave Hala years ago. Um, so I researched, I went around the United States, I researched as for, the, for National Geographic as an explorer to understand how people in the United States, my home, so how did they see democracy in action? Here in Virginia, people line up at a police training station to vote, which is an interesting thing, uh, especially with the relationship between the police and uh, African American communities like this one. <laughs>